Awesome. So um, I'm going to be throwing a lot of information at you. This, this presentation is, is really rich in terms of content. I'm going to kind of scoot and hit the high points. Uh, but I also wanted to include this as resources and references for you all to be able to go back to. Uh, so really, uh, what I'm going to spend some time talking about is engaging disadvantaged and minority communities. Um, and, and really with a special focus on social justice issues and watershed planning. Uh, and, and social justice issues really mean a, a broad set of, of classifications, and we'll talk uh, but before I jump into it, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the organization that I work for at the University of Kentucky. We're housed in the College of Ag. We're called the Community and Economic Development Initiative of Kentucky. It's kind of a long title. Most folks just refer to us as CEDIC. Like I said, we're situated in the College of Ag. Um, we do a lot of things uh, related to engaging communities and creating vibrant economies. We, we provide a lot of resources, research, we support community organizations building leadership, capacity. Uh, we do a lot of collaborative initiatives, a lot of facilitation of partnerships. So uh, one thing that I do want to uh, sort of acknowledge and recognize is that as you are working through uh, all of the, the questions that you're working through with your community organizations, if you feel like or feel inclined to reach out, uh, please reach out to us and, and we're more than willing to support you uh, to think through uh, how, to, how to approach some of this stuff as well. The other thing that I wanna make sure that you know is that we have a, a, an incredible depth of resources. Uh, so for all 120 counties in Kentucky, we have uh, a very updated version of, of data profiles for all of these things. Uh, we can also do uh, tailored data profiles, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you have a particular research question, our research team loves to help folks think through how best to be informed on those. But to, to, to really sort of go back to, to previous presentations, you know, some of the things that have came up around, around water quality and water engagement is, you know, we're dealing with an issue where uh, we have folks that have limited knowledge, but a typical high concern where our, our actions often don't necessarily meet the need. We know we're dealing with a situation where water isn't always a national priority. When we have a, a, a global pandemic going on, a collapsing economy, uh, folks thinking about pre-existing conditions and healthcare and, and national security, uh, we can see where water get, can get lost in the national narrative. But the other thing uh, that, that really sort of uh, moves into this next conversation is, is the idea of these group affinities, reasoning, really the entanglement of our, our own beliefs and the complexity of our individual experiences as it relates to water. So, you know, as we think about uh, disadvantaged communities or environmental justice, I wanna invite you to use the chat box again uh, and, and share, you know, is, is there a disadvantaged community or an environmental justice community that you are working with in particular? And if so, I'd ask that you, you simply add that to the chat box and, and we'll sort of watch that and monitor it and I'll, I'll come back to it at the end of the presentation. I want to start with the end. And I had, I had presented this to a colleague of mine and, and this was a suggestion he made was, you know, start with the end here. So I, I want to tell you the moral of the story before I even get through the story. Uh, the one thing that I want to emphasize is to broaden the approach and the sort of scope of efforts. Uh, to think about water quality beyond water uh, and think about it, it, its broader impacts. Be authentically empathetic to the folks who are struggling. Uh, it's really hard to imagine and put ourselves in, in different places and different shoes, uh, but it's really important. Uh, and that includes and really involves listening. Uh, related to broadening our approach, one of the things that I've found really successful is connecting and uh, intersecting with issues that matter with folks. Uh, and in particular with environmental justice communities, I will suggest to value BIPOC contributions. And if you're unfamiliar with what BIPOC means, what, I, what I'm referring to here are, are Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Uh, in many cases, these folks are doing the things already. It may not look like the way that we do it from a dominant community perspective, but many times they're getting things done without the resources, uh, but we have to approach them with, uh, with a value in mind of, of what they are bringing to the table in their own communities. Uh, I also like to emphasize this idea of, of trying to find ways to move from participating in an activity 
to actually leading and being an owner of that activity, whether it's water quality monitoring or, or uh, working with, with folks on litter pickup, those sorts of things. But the other thing I want to touch on is this idea of funding metrics. So I know funding is critical to the work that we all do. But what I want to acknowledge here is that representation, and in particular diversity, has kind of became the new regional. So, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, we were all pushing for these ideas to be regional, to be regional, work with regional partners, you got to have a regional impact. And funders started to, to, to fall in line. Now you will not apply for a, a, a water related grant hardly without acknowledging who your regional partners are in that impact. The same can be said now in terms of diversity, not only with federal partners, but also with private philanthropic organizations or philanthropies. Uh, they will ask you literally to share a picture of your leadership team. Give us a picture of your board, prove that you are diverse and, and document the impacts to vulnerable populations, whether that be positive or adverse. So really in terms of the funding paradigm right now, diversity does matter. Uh, in terms of this innovation and creativity, this is what I'm really thinking about. You got, we gotta think outside the box around how we uh, really address these systemic issues. Uh, and, and one of those creative ways is to think about stacking capital uh, because capital can obviously be directed to one particular thing, but when we can start to stack that capital for a number of efforts that under this large umbrella improve community resiliency or water quality, we all win. Uh, so again, just to reemphasize that idea of broadening the approach, both the scale and the format of engagement, to be cognizant and aware of the social constraints of partners, um, really be thoughtful around the inclusion of partners uh, and those stakeholders that Stephen was mentioning earlier. Uh, really be aware of issue intersections and think bigger than, than water quality. And again, be authentic in those interactions. But, but how? That's the question. How do you do this stuff? I will say uh, that it starts with civil dialogue, uh, being able to have those conversations uh, in an empathetic and authentic way, but also it involves a lot of creativity and how you message uh, specific folks. So what we're talking about really is not a technical solution. We're not talking about uh, an, an intervention per se. What we're talking about is a long-term engagement strategy that, that really thinks about all of the pieces to this because what the literature shows is that dominant groups uh, white folks like myself, white men, homeowners, median income folks are dominantly uh, engaged in these efforts and that people of color and, and those of lower income brackets are often underrepresented but also disproportionately impacted uh, by water quality. Uh, the research also shows that processes that treat the public as having a singular unified interest often fail to recognize all of those diverse voices and, and leaders. Uh, but then I've also added this thing that, that I'm sure you all have seen, that there are a number of both ecological and cultural benefits to, to great community engagement. Not only can they support the implementation, uh, they can bolster funding, building capital, but also building trust. Because when you get things done, you build trust. You've all seen something similar uh, around you know, decision-making processes and participation. This is really what I have in mind uh, when I get started, I, I really target moving things to that right hand side. You know, how can I support and help people make decisions around policy? How can I bring in decision makers by stakeholders, that team building dialogue roundtables, and getting to those negotiations where everyone feels like they win? Okay. One of the ways, or one of the reasons that we've got where we are, is that we often separate environmental issues from social issues. Uh, we know if, if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs or other social theory, when the community is facing uh, tough challenges, whether we're talking employment, housing, poverty, uh, environmental problems tend to go to the wayside. They are not prioritized as much, unless we're talking about a direct impact to water supply coming out of that faucet. So again, thinking about that broadening approach of, of how to connect these environmental issues to broader social issues, can also pay dividends when we're building that stakeholder. And, but we have to acknowledge that participation in, in traditional ways cost real money. That transportation to a meeting, that childcare cost, cost money and it disproportionately impacts people of lower incomes. 
So those formal meetings that we're all sort of missing uh, from nine months ago, pre, pre-COVID, we may want to rethink how we do those because often formal meetings uh, also carry formal challenges to marginalized communities. Uh, and, and one note here in particular communities of color, this sort of thing happens uh, much more frequently in community oriented events that are already happening, perhaps through the church or through uh, organizations, uh, rather than these really typical environmental organ, or, or, oriented events. In the literature, when we think about urban populations, uh, you know, northern Kentucky, Lexington, Cincinnati, while this research doesn't pull directly from Kentucky, it's pulling from uh, sort of, uh, I believe, Minneapolis, what kept coming up in, in communities of color was this idea that uh, it didn't matter unless it was impacting the drinking water supply, that that's where sort of the concern stopped that often water was not a central piece to the community identity and that it was covered up. If you think about Lexington and the fact that we have a stream running through the city that is literally covered up and no one can see it, uh, that creates a barrier to even having that, that human connection. Uh, we also have a, a, a lack of, of really diverse leaders who are championing water issues that people are listening to. Again, they're out there, uh, but they're oft, often in their own communities, championing their community. But one of the issues that we often have is that we frame these topics around technical solutions when really we need to be framing them around more community or humanistic synergistic solutions um, that, that really promote dialogue around broader topics for folks. Here are just a couple unique constraints when we're thinking about people of color. Uh, you know, this cultural constraints around water and safety uses. You know, if you're thinking about a, a, an immigrant class uh, from a, a religious group where modesty is important, uh, you may not see that group out there playing in the river the same way you're going to see spring breakers playing in the river. Uh, if you think about recreation, uh, I know for my wife who's Nigerian, uh, recreation and, and like boating is just a, a foreign thing to her, literally because so many of these spaces in her mind are sort of white dominated or controlled spaces that in her life, she's never really felt safe uh, to enjoy water in the way that I did growing up, uh, just because that wasn't in my frame. But really what I wanna focus here is this idea of distrust, uh, that our dominant culture's limited intercultural understanding of history and oppression can create distrust. And that is a latent fear within people of color. And it's something that we're really seeing bubble up right now uh, through national conversations, through the Black Lives Matter movement, through what we're seeing happening in Louisville and beyond. Um, so it really is uh, a precedent and, and a thing that is happening that we have to be aware of. And, and that's why that empathetic and authentic conversation is so important. But, but these, are, these, are, these are really important because it frames how we may want to discuss uh, water, uh, because these beliefs sort of uh, frame this cultural complexity that we're dealing with. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip to a couple examples because I, I wasted a little bit of time with my technical gaffe at the beginning. But these are in here with the citations. Really, this idea of linking water to other challenges is what I want to focus on. You know, housing, transportation, workforce development. All of these things can have relationships to water, and I'm, I'm going to show you how. So one, one resource that I want you to know about is this Southern Rural Development Center resource on civil dialogue. It's a whole website that has all sorts of great curriculums, guides, tools, fact sheets that really talk about the intersection of race relations and civil dialogue. Now, why it specifically says race relations, I want to also acknowledge that this sort of uh, curriculum and, and these guides also do a, a great work of, of sort of pulling, pulling the wool back off of uh, uh, sort of working with other disadvantaged communities, whether we're talking about low income uh, or others. But a couple examples I wanna, I wanna sort of throw up here uh, around environmental justice and, and, and climate in particular. Uh, the Kentuckians for the Commonwealth did a, a great acknowledge or a great document where they started to do an analysis of environmental justice. I haven't looked at the chat box yet, but I imagine some of these may be in there. You know, minorities, poor folks, older folks, young folks, folks that are linguistically isolated, uh, immigrants per se. Uh, 
these are often groups we think about in terms of environmental justice. But one of the other groups that you may not think about are proximity to these other things. So, you know, are you living in proximity to mining or other extractive uh, operations, to coal haul? And why would that be important? Because these groups may be uh, exposed to things that those other dominant groups may not be, and it gives you a way to start to reframe that. One example, an urban example that I'd love to share uh, is in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, you know, obviously the capital of the Confederacy, lots of attention around the Stonewall Jackson Monument over the last couple months. Uh, it also is home to the James River, uh, situated in the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, but also uh, is home to a number of low-income, formerly redlined communities. And if you're unfamiliar with what redlining means, is this was at that time a legal precedent within financial institutions where they could deem entire communities uninvestable. Uh, often they were minority communities, uh, but what we also know in these communities are they're usually minority, they're usually low income, uh, but when we look at climate change data, they can be between 5 and 12 degrees hotter than their uh, counterparts in, in other parts of the community. So through an effort, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and, and large philanthropies uh, working with local churches, they acquired about a quarter million dollars, $250,000 in funding to support uh, urban tree canopy. What we know about urban tree canopy, right, is that it lowers uh, the temperature. Uh, it helps uh, sort of address social cohesion. Uh, it starts to let us talk about non-point source pollution, sedimentation, erosion in a different way. Uh, but we also know that urban tree cover is, is often directly correlated with median household income, and that there is an environmental equity and a burden uh, of these amenities in low-income communities. That this distribution is uneven uh, uh, and, and often disfavors uh, racial minorities or, or low-income communities. There's also this, this idea around uh, environmental amenities that is starting to take place, but typically we only think about uh, parks, open spaces, uh, and this vegetated cover. We know that there are a number of benefits to, to vegetated cover, but we also know that urban tree canopies require uh, extra water demand. They do have maintenance calls. There are real allergens. So there are some concerns that have to be addressed from folks uh, when we're having these conversations. This, this stuff is complicated, right? Another example that I want to share in Eastern Kentucky is in Whitesburg. So this really came out of some downtown revitalization efforts where the community was flooding. Uh, they were having bull water, water advisories often. Uh, through an economic development uh, program, they're thinking about how do we do some placemaking? How do we create accessibility? Let's do some sidewalk audits. Uh, and what they realized is that they have a great opportunity to do some low impact development rain garden demonstration sites that treat stormwater on site and provide them an outlet for some education and some programming to hopefully have more uh, broader conversations around stormwater management in particular in, in that small community. Another one I wanna share is a Brownfields program. And, and, and Brownfields uh, programs may be a great thing for you to look into as, as you start to look for interventions or funding. So this was a project in Virginia that I worked on a long time ago with a number of partners. But really what we're looking at here are two, two distinct pictures of the same place. Uh, on the right, you see a, a, what was an old coal haul site, a tipple site. Uh, it was abandoned when that, that uh, coal company closed down, leaving sort of this mine scarred area that was directly impacting water quality with some AMD and, and other discharges. Through a number of efforts, they turned this community or the community uh, with partners turned this into a beautiful park and demonstration site. And one of the things that they did is they added a walking path to address community health. They added a number of signs uh, really to celebrate that coal history. We're talking about coal country here. Uh, so one of the things you had to do was acknowledge that, that history, but you also had to acknowledge it within the, the idea of, of the water cycle or restoring the American chestnut, stream restoration. See, we've got a little fisherman down there because we know that this community is dominated by outdoorsmen who valued being able to catch smallmouth bass in that creek. Uh, so being able to sort of provide these elements uh, to why this is important has really paid dividends in this community. Now, in general, what I would suggest is that, 
that the economic development lens is sometimes a good lens to approach water quality and water development and, and watershed planning because we know uh, water underpins every facet of economic development, whether we're talking about drinking at home, industrial processes, tourism, quality of life, all of this stuff is dependent on available water. What I want to share is, is some comments that came from our first impressions program. So SEDIC offers, offers a first impressions programs to communities and what we're talking about here is like a secret shopper campaign where we send volunteers to your community uh, just like they would go to a store and they provide comments around that experience. And then we do a, a huge public forum and share those and, and work with the community to think about how we can address it. Comments that have came up in first impression visits that relate to water often relate to they found a bull water advisory online, they're afraid to visit. Uh, they, they saw a lot of litter, or they didn't see accessible points. They often note river assets or lake assets is underutilized. We've heard comments about the smell. We've also uh, had, had quotes shared by locals who essentially tell those visitors, you don't wanna go in the water, don't touch the water, don't play in it. It's that cultural narrative of their own interpretation of, of that water themselves. The other thing that I would note is that we have a business retention and expansion program that works with communities doing economic development. And we often hear antidotally about how those industrial park visitors want to go downtown to visit. And if you think about those downtowns situated on, on a river, you know, I'm thinking about Whitesburg, I'm thinking about Hyden, I'm thinking about Barberville, even though it's not completely situated, there, there's some development there. Um, what we hear is, often around food-based businesses and their constraints for grease traps. Uh, we hear about flooding concerns. We hear about intermittent water supply. So these are in ways to get into that local business community, to get them to buy into some of the water quality uh, benefits, whether we're talking stormwater, flooding, those sorts of things. I have a number of resources in this, in this slide deck that I, that I hope you can go back and revisit. Uh, a number of, of communities in Kentucky have received funds. I'm not gonna get into any of this, uh, but I added it in here for you to be able to go back to. All of these are resources that speak directly to uh, water management or community engagement. Uh, I've included a, a number of other uh, states and communities screening tools that they're using to, to address environmental racism or climate change. Uh, there's some great ones on here around uh, sort of heat, heat island trackers, equity tools. There, there is a growing body of, of literature and research out here right now uh, that, you can, that you can go to. But I also want to just reemphasize the idea and the fact that if you would like to reach out or if you want additional assistance in thinking through some of this stuff, in particular around how to connect economic development conversations to water or uh, particular partners that we may have relationships that we know may have an affinity for the things that you're working on, please, please, please reach out to us. I'm sorry that I took too much time with my technical gaffe, um, and I'm glad you all let me be the guinea pig here uh, on my multiple screens, but uh, I am more than willing to take some questions, comments, or, or follow up, Stephen, however you'd like to, to move forward there.